Good morning, good afternoon, y'all. This is Brother John with our Hebron Online Facebook Sunday School for Adults. The title of our study is Return, Return. Repentance from Sin Can Stop Its Spiraling Effects. Repentance from Sin Can Stop Its Spiraling Effects. We never truly let go of the past. Even when change comes, it's hard to leave the past behind. In what ways is this is your past still with you today? In what ways is your past still with you today? What makes breaking from the past a challenge? Probably because it's a habit. Somebody mentioned a habit this morning. Uh, it's hard because what we get used to, maybe we feel comfortable with the past. Sometimes it's necessary though to leave the past behind. So let's talk a little bit about 1 Kings 15 and 16, and let's, we're going to get to King Asa here. Solomon ruled over Israel's golden age. He amassed great wealth and led the nation in some massive building programs, including the temple and royal palace. Although Solomon began with great promise, he did not remain loyal to God. He worshipped his wives' false gods at the sacred shrines he built for them, and his unfaithfulness to God led to the kingdom's eventual demise. After Solomon died, his son Rehoboam assumed the throne and inherited a glorious kingdom. When the people asked Rehoboam to give them relief, he ignored them. Instead of lightening the load, the counsel given to him by his father's advisors, Rehoboam followed the advice of his friends instead and demanded even more work and threatened the people. Rather than accept Rehoboam's unreasonable demands, the people of the northern kingdom seceded and walked away, and Israel was no longer a united monarchy, but divided in north and south. Rehoboam retained his rule over the smaller southern kingdom, and Jeroboam retained rule over the northern kingdom, which retained the name of Israel. So Rehoboam ruled Judah for 17 years and was followed by his son. Now, he's been called Abijah, he's been called Abijam. It's one of those two who ruled for three years. Abijah did not wholeheartedly follow the Lord as David, his father, did. As a matter of fact, once you get away from David, Solomon is compromising, Rehoboam is compromising, uh, then you get to Abijam, he's compromising. But then you come to Asa, King Asa. Asa would be like his dad. Would Asa be like his dad? Here's the question. And fail to follow the Lord wholeheartedly? Or would he embrace the idolatrous practices of Solomon and the others? So here's a map, sort of give you a, a helpful look at these two kingdoms. You have... Uh, Israel and Judah. So as we read through this, we're interested in King Asa on the bottom. King Asa. Look for the acts that show repentance, that show that something has changed, at least from this leader's point of view, from where Judah was and where it is today. And then how are these pit, a picture of trust in God as well? There will be trust in God, but there will also be a lack of trust in God as we look at these, at these acts of repentance and we look at King Ace's actions. So let's start with wholehearted. Wholehearted, verses 9 through 15. In the 20th year of Rehoboam, king of Israel, reigned Asa over Judah. And 41 years he reigned in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Meacha. Now, we kidded about these names today. There's so many different names. And in the Hebrew language, they didn't have any vowels. They had markings, but those were added later. Uh, so we don't really know. Meacha sounds good to me. The daughter of Abishalom. What are the benefits and detriments of following ungodly leaders. We were talking about this a little bit today. Uh, Asa followed Abisham, Abishal, and he was an ungodly leader. Well, for one thing, even if you aren't as 
godly. Even if you aren't as godly as you should be, you still look more godly than the one who came before you. But there's a detriment. You had to clean up their mess. You have to clean up their mess. He goes on to say this about his wholehearted following of the Lord. And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. He took away the sodomites out of the land, which implies there were sodomites in the land. Now, this has also been translated male cult prostitutes or perverted persons. It's in the masculine, and the context leads us to believe it is those who performed homosexual acts as an act of worship before their God and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. And also Maaka, his mother, even her, he removed from being queen because she made an idol in a grove. And the god Ashtaroth is mentioned is mentioned here, and there's a lot of issues that uh, these Israelites and these Judahites and these people had with Baal and Ashtoreth and Molech and high places and uh, just some crazy stuff. So what actions did Asa take, and would these be actions we need to take today? Well, if it were possible... For a leader to do that and, and they were called a Christian nation, it may be necessary. Maybe at least among the people of God, it might be necessary as well to remove certain influences and certain idols and certain people from positions of authority if you're trying to bring the people to a wholehearted devotion to God. It may not occur in our nation, but if a nation claims to be a Christian nation or to be a nation that follows the God of the Bible, it probably needs to act in a certain way. It goes on to say this about Asa. He destroyed Maaka's idol, burned it by the brook Kidron. And the high places were not removed. Now the high places were places they would go that were literal high places where they go to worship their gods. And they had some elaborate temples were built in those high places. It was the allowing in of these pagan places of worship, not just altars, but even temples to the gods. It's a place set aside to worship these false gods. Uh, we, we learn actually in Second Chronicles that it was more the high places of Israel than the high places of Judah that Asa was allowing. But it goes on to say this. It says, nevertheless, Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days, and he brought in the things which his father had dedicated and the things which himself had dedicated into the house of the Lord, silver and gold and vessels. So he's making some changes, but there's still some tension there. He didn't remove the high places, but his heart was perfect to the Lord. And think about this. How can one's heart be perfect yet still have unfinished business with the Lord? So if we take your heart being perfect, meaning that you have a heart that's wholehearted toward the Lord and you have your heart totally dedicated to the Lord. Our hearts can be that way, totally dedicated to the Lord, but we can still have stuff missing as well. So we need to think about this. We can be just as guilty as Asa can be. You want to be wholehearted. You want to shoot for, for dealing with those high places in your life. But uh, you can still have issues, even if your heart is perfect before the Lord. As a matter of fact, I propose this. A perfect heart motivates us to want to deal with our high places. There's a passage of scripture it mentions in our lesson. It's from Jesus. Matthew 12, 30 says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And here's a question. How does the standard Asa follows compare to the standard Jesus set in this passage? Well, that's what Asa's seeking to do. But we can all fail, maybe not love the Lord with our soul, maybe, or not in our mind, or in our strength. When you come to worship the Lord, when you come to worship the Lord at church, don't put your mind in neutral. Love God with your mind. Are we any different from Asa? Well, probably not, except we have the Holy Spirit there to help us. He certainly can. But wholehearted devotion is what we're looking for. Then we have cornered. 
and there was war between Asa and Baasha, king of Israel, all their days. All these 40 years, like a 40-year war. And Baasha, king of Israel, went up against Judah, and he built Ramah that he might not suffer any to go out or come into Asa, king of Judah. So he's almost creating a barrier or a hindrance for the southern kingdom by building up Ramah, keeping people from going in and out, keeping people from traveling in and out. So here's what Asa does. Asa takes all the silver and gold that are left in the treasury of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and delivers them to the hands of his servants. Okay? So we've got him taking all this money, delivering it to the hands of the servants. So what does he do with that? He sends these resources to Ben-Hadad, the son of Tabriman, the son of Hezion, king of Syria, who dwelt in Damascus, saying, let there be a, tweet, a treaty between you and me as there was between my father and your father. See, I have sent you a present of silver and gold. Come and break your treaty with Baasha, king of Israel, so that he will withdraw from me. So here's what's going on. The king of Israel, Baasha, has a treaty with the king of Syria, King Ben-Hadad. Uh, Ben-Hadad is going to be bribed by the riches of Judah to break that treaty so that the king Baasha of Israel won't have all this power that's available to him to try to uh, control Judah. Basically what happens is by breaking the treaty, and that's what happens, uh, the king of Israel turns his attention toward Syria and away from Judah at this point in time. Now, I initially thought this was a good idea, but there's a passage that tells us that what Asa actually did was wrong in God's eyes. You have to go to 2 Chronicle 16 to find it out, where we have Hanani the seer coming to King Asa and telling him these words. These are really good words, and especially when we get down to verse 9, I want you to hear what it has to say, because I think it still applies today. He says, because you have relied on the king of Syria and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Were the Ethiopians and the Lubim not a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Now let's stop there because we don't have this record in 1 Kings, but we have it in 2 Chronicles. There was a war that Asa fought against the Ethiopians and the Lubim. And whenever you see an I-M ending on a word, it often means a plural. So this was a group, the Lubim. Uh, they were a huge army, many chariots, many horsemen. Yet you relied on the Lord and he delivered you. God took care of you back then. But listen what happens. Now this verse 9 is a good verse to memorize. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. So let's just stop right there. Listen to that truth, and, and you tell me, is it true today? For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. So if our heart is loyal to God, does God desire to show himself strong? I don't see why he doesn't. I think he still does. He definitely did here. But listen to what happened with Asa. The last sentence down at the very bottom says this. In this, you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. So by relying on his own power, he dealt with an initial problem with a temporary solution. Instead of trusting in God and giving a permanent solution to the problem. And that's where he failed. He loved the Lord. He did a lot of repenting. He did a lot of changing. But just like his father David, he still had feet of clay. He still had problems. And listen, we're the same way. Even the most godly among us still make mistakes. We still have problems. We still have sin in our lives. But it's important as we see Asa's story, we learn that he's not any different than we are. So, are we easily tempted? 
to depend on our own resources rather than God during times of crisis. We can be. Is that what happened here? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Because Second Chronicles tells us so. He trusted in his own riches instead of trusting in the Lord. But finally, we get to resolved. We do get a temporary solution here. And it's amazing. You know, God is faithful even when we're not. We don't want to sin so that his grace will abound more. We don't want to be unfaithful so he'll show himself more faithful. But it is a truth that God is faithful even when we're not. So Ben-Hadad heeded King Asa and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel. He attacked Aishon, Dan, Abel, Beth, Maacah. It's an interesting name. We just talked about Maacah. And all Kinneroth, or Jinneroth, with all the land of Naphtali. By the way, one of the names for the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, is Chinnaroth. Chinnaroth. So that's a name that you would be familiar with. Land of Naphtali as well. This is all northern areas around Syria. Now it happened when Baasha heard it that he stopped building at Ramah. He stopped creating this hindrance and remained in Tursa. So in what way did King Asa prompt the actions of Ben-Hadad? Well, he paid him. Were the actions of Asa sinful? They were because he did not rely upon the Lord. Brought a temporary solution to the problem, but not a permanent one. So the resolution is only temporary. Then Asa made a proclamation throughout Judah, none was exempted, and they took away the stones of the timber of Ramah, which Baasha had used for the building, and with them he built Geba of Benjamin and Mizpah. So he used those same stones used against him for a better purpose. So how did this action serve as a rallying point for the people? It provided them an opportunity to turn the tide in this battle, it sounds like. How did this action remind people of God's faithfulness? Because God will take care of us even when we're unfaithful. Even when we miss it, God provides. So as we close today, I want you to think about this. God expects the leaders of his people and all people to wholeheartedly follow him. God will hold all in account one day. Believers must guard their hearts and use wisdom when facing difficulty. And God is always faithful, even when we are not, and often in ways we do not see. Thank God for his faithfulness. Let me leave you with these thoughts. Think about what you learned today from God's word. Think about how you'll apply it to your life. Think about how it needs to change your life. Are you relying on your riches other than Jesus Christ? How will you love others more like Jesus this week because of this lesson? Well, think about that. If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you ought to be loving your neighbor at least like you love yourself. And then can you lead others to Jesus? Remember, Jesus is faithful even when we are not. And we can see the unfaithfulness of men. So let's trust in the faithfulness of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity you've given us to look at your word, apply your word to our lives and our hearts. And Father, help us to learn the lessons from King Asa and learn to be better leaders in the process. Lord, bring people to you. Convict us through your Holy Spirit. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. And God bless you, and you have a great Sunday.